Welcome. Aloha from Honolulu. Welcome. Thanks all of you here in Hawaii, on the mainland, wherever you may be for joining us. Good afternoon, good morning, whatever time it may be for you. These are now pre-recorded and streamed later and then put on YouTube and Vimeo and available for viewing at your convenience. And we hope you'll do that and share these. And today we have with us our birthday girl, Judge Sandra Sims, retired from the bench of the state of Hawaii, well-known author, and like the rest of our panel, very active in community service in many respects, just back from a really moving and intense trip to the mainland, to the south and other areas. We have Rebecca Ratliff in Atlanta, or near to it, and Rebecca has just watched her son graduate from college. So this is a really memorial time and week. Louise Ng, partner at Denton's, winner of many awards this year, including from the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, and David Larson, chair of the American Bar Association's dispute resolution section, Professor at Ham Mitchell Hamlin in St. Paul. And so today, folks, we thought we'd talk a little bit about leaders and leadership. What we need, what may be missing, what might help us the most. And as our birthday girl, Sandra, Judge, you want to start us off? What would you look for in leadership? And are there people out there who exhibit some of the things you're looking for in leaders now for these times? That's actually kind of a tough question to, to, to ask in these times. But the things that appeal to that, that impress me the most are the ability to empathize with people and certainly to have some integrity and character to begin with. Um, those don't seem to be all the qualities that we're seeing in people who are at least professing to be leaders at this point. Um, that's just my take on it right now. It's a little discouraging, um, but there are bright lights around. And I, and I know some of you, and you guys are part of that. So you certainly chuck in the work that you're doing um, in bringing so many issues to the forefront. Uh, in, the, in this community and, uh, you know, around the nation and bringing together, you know, folks that you encounter to discuss these issues, that's a component of leadership, which is certainly uh, going to your character and integrity. Um, but there are others. Okay. Rebecca, your thoughts? Are there people out there now who have some of those really valuable qualities and attributes? There are still some. Um, and, you know, because the world is um, evolving in a different space now, um, because of COVID and all the other issues that, that we are dealing with and that our next generation is dealing with, um, I think that, uh, I think there are some. Uh, we are seeing servant leaders um, rise yeah. because of the changes that we're seeing. But also what we're seeing, I was thinking as Judge Sims was talking, we're also seeing audacity and allyship. And I was explaining, I've been published to say that ally is a verb in the, in the um, dictionary, it's a noun, but when actually in practice, it's, it's a verb, but you have to be uncomfortable to be an ally and leading um, efforts in allyship is, uh, it, it can be tough because it's unpopular work, um, but if you are not uncomfortable, you are not an ally. Huh. So you, you wanna tell us a little bit more about what you mean by servant leadership? And Louise, I know you have some thoughts on that as well. Yes, by servant leadership, I'm referring to um, the ability and the willingness to put others first and to serve where you see a need without having to be asked to step up and to, and, and it's somewhat self-sacrificing 
Um, but it's, you know, being a good steward of the talents that you've been given and being willing to share your gifts to, um, you know, for the good of all. Louise, your thoughts? I think that, that was beautifully said, Rebecca. And um, I, I think that we're currently seeing some really bad examples of leadership that hopefully will lead us to a place of improving leadership. I also think that as we get more diverse um, with the profile of our leaders, more women, people of color, um, the next generation, whatever that you know, we're seeing a different model. And um, I agree with what um, Rebecca and Sandra said about you know maybe qualities coming out that maybe weren't so important or overlooked were overlooked before, such as you know the empathy, the emotional, uh, you know your it, it, EQ, as well as kind of being able to balance that EQ and being able to motivate people, but also knowing when you need to lead and yeah. you know, sort of set the role and set, set um, sort of set the path for people um, and kind of let them know, you know, what your mission and goal is. But I also think that the idea that we're, we should be moving away from an autocratic, I know everything top-down style of leadership to one that is more inclusive and as you say, you know, recognizes the value, not just of the person on top, but the people that um, enabled them to get there uh -huh. and are supporting their work. Uh -huh. Collaborative leadership, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this is a group of four people who, all of whom have faced, overcome, worked with, and navigated their way through exceptional challenges to get to the leadership positions, the respect, the admiration that you've earned. Hey, David, what worked for you in becoming a leader as you have in the ABA section of dispute resolution? Before I get to that question, I just want to congratulate Judge Sims on her 39th birthday. <laughs> we all got to had many of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually a graduate of Jack Betty Jr. High School, if you remember him. And we were the, we were the 39ers, was our team. Um, so 39 is a number that I'll always remember. So congratulations. Um, uh, and the other thing I wanted to say, Chuck, just, just to pick up on that earlier question about the characteristics of leaders, um, I, yeah, I got to put courage in there. And, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm watching Liz Cheney on a, a literal kamikaze. Oh, yes. <laughs> And the, the yeah. phrase nation before self, you know, comes to mind that this is somebody putting nation before self. Um, yeah, she is just being attacked ferociously by her party for what she's doing. But it's clear she's putting the Constitution and the nation uh, above herself. And, and she's just unflappable. And even though, you know, historically and traditionally, I don't really agree with many of her policies. Uh -huh. I certainly so. admire her for what she's doing now. Um, I think she's just doing wonderful things. Um, uh, I think uh, it just in terms of kind of overcoming obstacles, it takes a certain persistence, you know, dedication and optimism that you you really just have to, not to be too, too uh, naive, but I think you have to be a little bit of a glass half full person sometimes that even though um, things are looking dark, sometimes you have to focus on the positives and, and uh, that's, I think, can give you strength in darker times. Um, that's always been helpful to me when, um, uh -huh. when I've had some of the challenges I've faced. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so circling around, are there people out there now who are exhibiting the kinds of character, conscience, courage, and charisma that might offer us some hope for future leadership? Rebecca, any examples? I am. I am. I'm. I'm trying to think of an example. I'm drawing a blank. I'm, I started in my mind um, since David gave us the great example of of Liz Cheney. Um, I was, you know, trying to think of um, who uh, who else in our government I'd like to name that that immediately comes to mind. Um, Rankin, Jamie Rankin. 
Um, um, yeah, and I'll also uh, name that senator from, um, I forget whether he's a state rep or senator from Illinois. Um, Kinsinger. Kinsinger. Yes. His family has turned on him mm. because he's yeah. taken a stand to do what's right. Yeah. Um, what's right for the country, what's right for humanity, uh, for humankind. Uh, his, there are some members of his family who have um, turned against him. That's a, that's a, that's uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, uh, I think it was on one of the late night shows, they contrasted Liz Cheney talking about, uh, talking in the prior uh, House hearing about Ukraine and, you know, really putting down the Ukraine um, hearings, contrasting to what she's doing now. And, you know, it's just, it sort of shows how fluid the situation can be where you may totally disagree with her approach and her, uh -huh. uh, you know, the first time. And then when, you know, something like the insurrection happens, I guess it really shows, it kind of draws the line between people who are showing up with metal and principle uh, versus those who go along for expedience and trying to win their party's vote. So I agree with David. Yeah, that's, you know, she deserves yeah. kudos. And it's interesting, you know, watching her go through this and, and remembering a time when, you know, strong leadership could, what did mean that you stood up for the principle of the people, we didn't have to agree with you, but we could respect what you stood for. Um, because we knew that, that there was some integrity to that position. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing with her. You're right, Ed, there's so much of her other points of view that I can't agree, but I have a tremendous respect for her integrity and in standing up. And that's that's another piece that we really don't see a great deal of uh, in these times as we once did. Uh, this trip I was just on uh, kind of brought to mind another person who I thought, Brian Stevenson, who you know headed up that Equal Justice Initiative uh, and been so involved in working in the South with, um, you know, with uh, uh, wrong, wrongfully convicted folks uh, throughout time. And the work that he's done uh, is certainly not very popular now in many circles, but it is such a necessary work in order for us to really kind of come together at some point. I think he still believes that we can come together as a nation and find peace. Otherwise, he wouldn't be doing this. And he's doing it in the middle of Montgomery, Alabama, of all places. And he certainly had his share of, you know, threats and and uh, um, uh, violence directed, you know, against him and 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 the work that he does as well. But to still stand for that, um, and to still really persist and push through, as he is doing, um, with this um, peace initiative, he calls it a peace initiative, peace and justice initiative, um, because we can't change until we acknowledge what's happened, and uh, and and. That takes courage, and certainly in this day and age, it takes tremendous courage and a tremendous amount of optimism. David, you alert, alluded to that when we talked about you have to still sort of see things as half full, that there is the possibility of change. And obviously, going through what I saw at his at the museum there, um, it is very, very easy to just sort of put your head down and say, this is a lost cause. We're not going to get through this. But for this leader to just say, I we can do this. I'm going to keep pushing and I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to keep sharing. And I'm going to keep showing this to you. There has to be this perspective that it's, it's possible. Um, mm -hmm. I guess we saw that in, you know, certainly the clearest example of that is, you know, Nelson Mandela. I mean, you could still, still hold on and still believe. Yeah, I think, in, and that's a really good point, Sandra. And, and, you know, sort of the persistence to get through and keep your eye on the prize. And I'm thinking in Hawaii of two, maybe three people um, based on a film I saw about women's sports at the UH and how it developed. Oh, yes. With Donis Thompson. Oh, yes. As well as Patsy Mink, uh, both of whom were kind of, you know, maybe um, polarizing characters during their time. They were very strong women, but their legacy, you know, their focus on just women's rights and um, equality is really something that, you know, we hold up today. The quotes they have from Patsy Mink on her statue in front of the state library are, are beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and Maisie Hirono is another one who, you know, 
has long been underestimated, but during the Trump years just said, you know, I need to speak out and yes, really changed her approach and is saying what needs to be said. You know, as we, as we talk about leaders and what qualities we think are important for leaders, and we'll go down with in integrity and honesty. And then we, then we look at former President Trump and we say that, wait a minute, it's like, I'm putting X's on all these desirable characteristics. Then you have to ask the question, is that how is he maintaining so much power? When we have our list of ideal characteristics and we're Xing out so many of them, how is this happening? It's just, a, I think, a really important question. And um, you know, it goes to kind of the future of the Republican Party if there is one. But, um, but I think it is something worth discussing is how is it possible that this man is retaining as much influence as he is even now when we're learning his role in January 6th, oh. uh, there are still people saying that he's our guy, he should be the nominee in 2024. I mean, I'll just yeah. put it out there. How do you, why, do you think, why do you think yeah. that's happening? Fear. Yeah, yeah well, well, Louise talked about emotional intelligence and you know it's important, but and I think he has great emotional intelligence. I mean, I mean, he understood how much xenophobia and misogynism and racism there is in America, and he was a master at tapping into that. And uh, you know, I think that's one explanation for his success. He has, he does have great emotional intelligence in a kind of a very dark way, mm -hmm. and he was able to kind of harness that. And I think that's one reason why he retains that kind of influence. That, that people are following behind him for all the worst reasons of humanity. Well, I have a feeling that his supporters would probably come up with a different list on what leadership means. Um, I have heard some people say that, you know, what seems to appeal to folks about Trump is this strongman idea. You know, you need strength to lead. Uh, it's kind of the qualities that lead to, you know, autocrats like Putin and Hitler and Mussolini. Uh, which kind of leads me to the other side of, uh, you know, I'm still trying to get my arms around why Biden's approval ratings are so low, because I keep thinking, okay, so, you know, people don't approve of him. I mean, did you just remember who was president before that? You know, should we, you know, also value the fact that he was able to win and hopefully change many of the directions of the country? Um, yeah, I'm still trying to unpack why. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting this, and sometimes I'm wondering if, 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 if I'm that out of touch, or if, uh, or, or if you know this whole notion of how we poll and how we get that information is now kind of flawed and maybe not um, as valuable or as as useful as it once was. Um, I, but I go back to to Rebecca's point of of, of fear. I think there's a there's a fear as well among, there has to be a fear um, among some of the followers that you're gonna lose some of the things that we've, courageous people that we've talked about, who've made these changes, who've gone out and, you know, you know, push for change. Like, like Patsy Mick is a great example because during her time, she was, huh, people hate, I mean, she was not, well, among those who, of us who cared about what she was doing, but in, in, in Congress and the nation, and even some places here, people didn't like the things that she, she was pushing too hard for many people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we see that when people are really, really, really pushing hard, there's that fear response that says, you're gonna take something away from, particularly in the area of Title IX sports, you know, my goodness gracious, the whole, all of college sports just almost railed against her. It's like, you can't do this because we're gonna have to, you know, shut down the football team. Come on, please. But, but still, she persisted. I mean, I guess that's the quote that's on her statue too. <laughs> she persisted. And people who are in that position of, of, of persistence, they do strike fear um, among those who feel that they may lose out. And then you have a Trump to come along and like you say, David, tap into that fear and bring it to the forefront. Um, I, 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 there's no, I, can't, I can't think of any other possible way to explain that um you know i mean he came on the heels of you know obama which i think was you know his uh, his election was you know quite a shock to the system for everyone but 
uh, and that was a good thing, I mean, in a good way, I don't mean that bad, and certainly, and then, you know, t- to think that there was this sort of, maybe there was this sort of backlash, like, oh my goodness, what's happening? Is this, is this a harbinger of the future that we're going to have all this diversity? Well, we're oh living God. in this, we're living this era of partisan loyalty, where we have people seeing their whole worldview is shaped by their partisan loyalty, and their ability, you know, their willingness to accept things as facts is shaped by their partisan loyalty. So that's, that is kind of frightening. To, uh, how yeah. are we going to shake yeah. people out of that, that, you know, you just don't fall into line with either CNN or Fox News? Yeah. You know, how can you Where did come, that come back from? and have more of a, you know, more of a balanced view? And in terms of that approval rating, you know, is, is there, have we lost the appreciation for the fact that um, it's a, you know, the executive can only do so many things, that there is a, there is a Senate that you have to get through, that there's a Supreme Court that can make decisions, the president over, has no control over that. So, um, you know, I think a lot of things are put, put on President Biden's shoulders over which he, he has no control, and the Republicans are more than ready to attribute, you know, the responsibility for everything to him. Um, you know, inflation is purely his fault, regardless of what's happening with global grain and Ukraine and everything else. And no, it's Biden's fault. Um, so, you know, this the, one of the dangers of that partisan view is this mm-hmm. unwillingness to take a more holistic view and think about what could be the possible causes beyond maybe the president of the United States. And let's think a little more globally. Mm-hmm. And you might find yeah. some global solutions. But I, I agree with everything I've heard. And um, the other thing I'll add while we're thinking together, because obviously none of us have the answers. If we did, uh, <laughs> maybe, um, yeah, we, we wouldn't need wouldn't this show. So, yeah, exactly. Um, but like-minded people um, have been emboldened. And so, and, and, and we know that if, even in our personal lives, people have very short memories. People have short memories and fear can be a positive and or a negative motivator. So, you know, all of the things that you all have stated, I think um, apply. And it's um, it's human nature to be fickle. If we go back all the way to Bible story, Moses got the <laughs> Israelites out of Egypt. And what did they do? <laughs> you know, yeah, they, you know, they, they, they got away from the Pharaoh, if you believe uh, that story. And, um, and, you know, they, they still weren't happy. You just can't please them. And they, yeah. it took them 40 years to make a two-day journey. The, the, the journey to the promised land, <laughs> really two days, but it took them 40 years. And uh, so the, and, the, and the reason is you can't get towards freedom. You can't move towards freedom with, you know, um, a mentality in bondage. And so, it's, you know, humans, we just, you know, we have, uh, sometimes we are attracted to the shiny things. Do we, do, do we see, can, can we name anybody that we think can bring the nation together and um, could be a viable candidate uh, for our next presidential election? That, can we think of any names that we would say, boy, I hope um, outside of Michelle Obama, who I wish would be a candidate. Um, <laughs> who has told us she and has no intention of running. <laughs> which is just, I know, which is just so bad. Uh, I wish you were. Like, yeah, the side of it, David, is that if we could think of those persons that are be that viable, given the climate that we're in and the one you just referred to, how part, who would want to take that role? On? Yeah. Who would want to do that? I mean, we could we could think of those folks, but why would you subject yourself, your family, your friends? And, and that's the and that's the really kind of dangerous part of it now, is that this leadership vacuum is so it's so vast, it's hard to even bring in those people that we say have those qualities. They're not willing to necessarily do that unless you're, you know, kind of pushed against a wall like Liz Cheney is, and you're in a position where you got to do it. Because when you brought up some really important insights, the, the fear approach and attack, it, depends on cultivating a bias that is really dehumanizing to a whole sector of people who, at least according to our beliefs, should be equally treated as human as everyone else. 
And you've also pointed out that what we might call inspiring resiliency may be one of the elements that enables people to survive that and to even overcome it. Are there people out there like Stacey Abrams or Cory Booker or others who are exhibiting the kinds of strength that might offer a charismatic alternative to that fear and bias, fear and loathing approach? Well, you named a couple. Um, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. I'm from Minnesota and I, I was a backer of Amy Klobuchar. Um, yeah. You know, I think I still think she would be a great candidate. Um, you know, but it, but as um, Sandra was saying, um, takes his toe. You're, you know, you're going to get attacked, and she was attacked um, for one thing that happened. that really wasn't something she did. It happened in a prosecutorial uh -huh. office when she was uh -huh. head of it. it. wasn't her doing it, but yeah. nonetheless was attacked um, again ferociously. So I don't know if she would even be willing to do it again. Yeah. I oh, think about, you know, I think of stuff like some of our, um, you know, uh, city leaders, because I think, you know, those that are mayors of large cities, you're probably <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a good position to just sort of get more. I, mean, I was thinking of like, like a Gavin Newsom or something, but then again, it's San Francisco. And so while he may have these qualities that we think of in terms of leadership, is that going to translate to you know, some Midwestern well, town. Is this all I, all I do did really appreciate him deputizing people to um, bring lawsuits for violations of the gun right. control <laughs> in response to, yeah. Yeah, that's a legal model. I thought yeah. it was just, yeah, that was I thought just, that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so that was yeah. brilliant. Pretty courageous, yeah. you know? <laughs> it's like, okay, this is what you want to do? Okay, we can do that too. Yeah, that's I thought different. that was great. <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was great. <laughs> yep. And what, a, you know, what about another factor that the media doesn't even address and we never see in campaign is we know that leadership really has to be an effective, collaborative, collective team exercise. Hey, and we never hear candidates for leadership talk about what kind of teams they might offer, what kind of teams yeah. they might put together. Yeah. yeah. So maybe one of the answers is find those people with inspiring resilience, courage, character, conscience, and charisma. Hey, bring those together hey, and present them as a team. And move away That's from partisanship. Yeah, it is interesting. In the team yeah. building to the leadership qualities in the team building. Mm. Mm. People That's have the courage. Because, oh, sorry, go ahead, David. I would say people have the courage to trust other people, you know, in that sense that if you're gonna be a, a true collaborator, you, you have to be willing to trust other people. And if you do that, they'll trust you. Yes, which is the other mark of a good leader to begin with is assembling those people that you can work together with and having that trust between them. And so that's another piece of it too. Exactly. Now, who are they? And who are these people that we can pull together and trust? That is that's a, good, a harder that's a question. Yeah, yeah, Louisa, I try and think of leaders nationally, state or local that have really assembled effective, inspiring teams. That's a much it's harder It's been a while. Question. It's been a while. Louise, I started talking the same time as you. I'm sorry. What, what oh, were you no, going to say? It was. I was just thinking of the fact that you know we're so we're very used to thinking of a leader, uh, you know, sort of one person leading, and that's been our model through well monarchies, presidencies, and the like. Um, and I think you know it's important to have that figurehead. But what you know what we're learning is that it's the people around them, as you say, it's the ability to collaborate and how strong your team is that also helps. Um, form that leader or makes that person effective. And, you know, maybe we need to rethink of leadership being not just about one leader, but as you say, David, the, you know, a collaborative approach. Maybe we will not, we won't get away from that model of wanting to focus on one person as sort of being the person who envisions and can articulate the mission, but 
Um, it's, you know, maybe it's also a matter of identifying the team, you know, and who, who mm -hmm. can build mm -hmm. each other up. A great point because yeah usually a, a leader is also a great manager it's not necessarily the other way around but if you have the right people around you and you can manage their talents um then you can be very effective as a leader yeah hey and in our last minute some final thoughts leadership what's the direction we really need to see i'm gonna stay with courage <laughs> Integrity. Mm -hmm. Persistence. It's a marathon. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I do agree with optimism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe all of those and the patience, persistence, and resilience of those who have managed to do that, the Mandelas, the Gandhis, and those leaders historically. Thank you all of your you for joining for us today. Yeah, go ahead, Luis. I was just saying, using your powers for good, not evil, you know, having EQ. Well, yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you guys have all done that. That's what you do. So that's what you guys all do. It's cool. Come back and join us again in a couple of weeks. We will explore more of the things that we hope will provoke thoughts and bring people together. Take care, have Aloha. a good week and a good weekend and happy birthday, Sandra. Happy Thank birthday. you. <laughs> Thanks Chuck for bringing us together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.